As the producer of this evening's broadcast, I'd like to share a few thoughts with you. These episodes are brought to you as a labor of love. My goal is to continue reaching out to more people in our younger generation with these truths, first-hand accounts of what happened to men and women who have served our country faithfully. There's a link in the video description to make a donation, and I would ask you to do so to help me continue these episodes. Thank you for watching, and God bless you. Good evening, and welcome to this installment of Women in War. I'm your host, Larry Capetto. The Vietnam War was a reflection of the troubled times in our country in the 1960s and early 1970s. Over 9 million military personnel served on active duty during the Vietnam era. Nearly 3 million Americans served in-country. 7,500 women served in Vietnam. Almost 85% of them were nurses. On today's program, we will feature the inspiring story of one of those Vietnam nurses, Lou Eisenbrandt. Lou served with the 91st Evac Hospital in Chu Lai. She experienced firsthand the horrors and ravages of war. Please join with me in honoring and saluting one of America's heroes, Lou Eisenbrandt, on this edition of Women in War. October of 1969 through October of 1970. One tour then? One tour. And did you enlist or drafted or what happened to you? Well, as, as a woman, we weren't drafted. Um, I guess you would say we enlisted. I joined, signed up at the end of my junior year in nurses training. And then I served, technically my senior year, I was considered on active reserve status, went to school, and then I was required to serve two years after that, after I graduated. Were you like a lot of the young men at the time? Did you feel a duty to serve your country? Or what sparked that interest? To... <laughs> Two very practical reasons. Um, one was I wanted a means of paying back my parents who had paid for my nursing education, which was very minimal in those days, but we didn't have much to start with, and I wanted to be able to do that. And secondly, I grew up in southern Illinois, very close to Scott Air Force Base, which was a huge Air Force Base, and all my high school friends were Air Force brats and there was no money in my family for travel and I thought this was my chance to do as the poster said and see the world. Now I had in mind Germany, England, I didn't have Vietnam, but <laughs> when you say, say yes to Uncle Sam, you go where they send you. I graduated in June of 68 and in November I was sent to Fort Sam Houston, Texas for officer's basic training for six weeks and then got orders for Fort Dix, New Jersey, which was my first duty assignment. I was at Fort Dix for about nine months and got a, um, a manila envelope in the mail one day and said, congratulations, you're going to Vietnam. That was it? That was it. I guess I wasn't necessarily overly fearful. Uh, I'm sure my parents were terrified. Um, but my roommate that I had had in, at Fort Dix had gotten orders about six months prior. So I knew that a lot of women were going. So it was, I probably nervous, just not sure what to expect, because I hadn't been very far from home at that point. When you fly into Vietnam, the first thing you notice is um, brown. It's a lush country, but when I arrived, it was uh, rainy season, monsoon season, and so the water, the, you fly over the rivers, and, and it's very brown. You open the door to the plane, and there's an incredible blast of hot, humid air, um, smells, a lot of different smells. Uh, at that point, 
though you're flying into a base, so it's not like being among the people, and so it, it wasn't didn't have the same impact that it does once you get off at your duty assignment, and then it really does sort of hit you. I had no no specific training at all. I served my first three months after I received my duty assignment and was sent up to the 91st evac. I spent the first three months on a medical ward, uh, seeing anything from uh, hepatitis, malaria, jungle rot, which is what you get when you walk in water in combat boots for days on end and don't dry your feet out, uh, intestinal worms, uh, anything that was not a war wound I saw for three months. And then I was asked by the chief nurse if I would consider moving down to what we would call the emergency room, which was R&E, receiving an emergency. And so I spent the last eight months in the emergency room. We were a full, I guess you'd say a full service hospital. We had all the, the, the normal things that a hospital would have. We also had a Vietnamese ward, so we saw Vietnamese civilians if villages got hit. We had a POW ward, so we saw Viet Cong and NBA. Um, we had OR and, and recovery and all that sort of stuff, intensive care and the ER. In terms of particularly the once I moved to the emergency room, the caseload varied from day to day. I mean, I remember working a shift and had one guy come in with, a, with an ingrown toenail. I also remember the day that a village got hit, a Vietnamese village, and we had 99 pa uh, patients within the 12 hour span that I was on duty. So it varied dramatically. The 91st was uh, a series of quant metal Quonset huts, which is what many of the VAC hospitals were. In terms of what we saw, absolutely everything. Like I said, it varied from uh, the ingrown toenail to medical issues, a lot of casualties and the casualties, I would say if I had to say what did we see the most of, it would have been what we called frag wounds or shrapnel. Uh, when you blow something up, you get little tiny pieces of metal that break off and depending on where they lodge in the body, you can either live with lots of tiny wounds or you can take one to the aorta and die within a very short period of time. I saw many amputees, many amputees, one, two, three limbs, uh, head injuries, uh, lots of uh, gunshot wounds. For those who have never seen one, it makes most gunshots, uh, most bullets make a very small entry wound, very large exit wound. So some of those were very deceptive. First thing we would do in the emergency room was to cut the clothes off of whoever came in so we could totally assess their wounds because it was there was a wide, wide variance. Most of our patients either came by ambulance or helicopters, probably more by helicopters than anything else. And they would come in all hours a day and night. We worked 12 hour shifts, six days a week. So 12 hours on and 12 hours off. And uh, Everybody, civilian, uh, in terms of casualties, marine, you know, obviously the units that were close by we saw more of, but we would see all the different branches of service as well as, as Vietnamese civilians, like I said. One thing you never forget are white phosphorus burns, horrendous, horrendous uh, damage to uh, a person. And there is a smell that to this day, I will never get out of my head. I, I will never forget the smell of that because it continues to burn the skin. I do remember well uh, a young man who came in uh, and had was a double amputee, he'd lost both of his legs, and he'd also taken a gunshot wound to the chest. And so when we stripped him down and rolled him over, his back stayed on the litter. I will never forget that as long as I live. He actually lived long enough through surgery that we evac'd him out to, to, to Japan, so I have no idea what happened to him after that. The other one that really stands out in my mind was a young man from the South who I met the day I came in country, he came in with me. We sort of became friends and he was assigned to a unit not far from our hospital. Came in early, a couple months after we got there with uh, some of his men who'd been wounded and he had some light wounds, it wasn't a big deal. Went back out and a couple months later he came, or probably six or seven months later, he came back in again and he was peppered from head to toe with shrapnel. 
And I didn't happen to be assigned to him. I was assigned to another uh, patient on another litter. But when they took him into the ER, I, into the OR, the, my friend who was working on him said, you know, he'll probably lose both of his legs. And that was the only time that I really, I would say, lost it. I just simply had to leave because I, I felt a really close personal attachment. I did follow up with him, actually, afterwards. He was, uh, I went down to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, which is where he was. He still had his legs, but he wasn't able to use them at all. And I think about him often and wonder if he still has his legs or if he finally lost them. I have a saying that I've always contended is the case in, was the case in Vietnam, and that was that we worked very hard and we played very hard. Um, I felt, for myself personally, I needed to decompress at the end of my shift. Now, when you work, when you work in the emergency room, any time you'd hear more than three helicopters coming in, you would report whether it was your shift or not. But yes, there was drinking. There was lots of drinking that went on. There. I know there were drugs. I personally did not get involved with drugs, but I know drugs were an issue. I don't think so much at the hospitals as you know, with the guys out in the bush. You partied hardy because you had to do something to forget. I also kept a journal, um, so writing helped. I think the people that really struggled with uh, like PTSD when they came home were those that didn't, didn't give themselves an outlet because you just, you cannot do that and then go back to your room and sit and think about that all night until you go on duty again. You had to, you had to kind of take yourself out of the situation. The first week that I was in the emergency room, it was tough because you saw things you had never seen before and I will never see again. No matter what kind of trauma nursing you do back here, it can't compare with what I did on a daily basis. But at the same time, you do have to develop a persona that says, I'm going to do what needs to be done because I would have been useless if I had fallen apart you know, every time we got a casualty in. And in terms of where we were, what we did, Usually the corpsman met the helicopters that would land on the helipad. helipad was literally right outside the emergency room. I mean, there was no, it, they carried them on gurneys. It's a, it was a very short distance. Usually those were met by the corpsman. And so we usually stayed inside the building unless there was some sort of issue. I would say several times a week, we would get in either KIA, killed in action, DOA, dead on arrival, in body bags, um, those would go to what was called graves and then shipped back to this country. Um, and occasionally we would get in guys that when the triage process was done, it was determined that there was no way to save their life. And what we usually did, if there were enough of us nurses, and there were only two or three of us on duty at a time, depending on how many casualties, they were usually put on a gurney back against the wall with a screen and one of us would sit and hold their hand until they died because there wasn't much else we could do. There were, I remember, on numerous occasions, if they were conscious, uh, most of them weren't, but if they were, or the guys that came in that weren't quite so badly wounded, would look up and look at you and say, hey, you look like my girl back home. I get goosebumps thinking about that. So it was, it was a little comfort to them. And yes, holding hands was good. And we tried to do that whenever we were, we had enough people on hand to do that. Well, most of them that were that close to death were, were not conscious to be saying much of anything. It was more a breathing. Um, but uh, it's, you know, they, we were just doing what we could. And there were times that, you know, they'd say, am I going to die? And of course we would say, no, you're, you know, we're gonna patch you up, you'll be fine. And sometimes we were able to, but many times we weren't. Basically the only care that casualties got before they came to our hospital was by the aid men out in the, out in the field. And he would slap on dressings. Uh, maybe there was a battalion aid station where they'd start an IV. And that was all that they would get before they came into, into our hospital. So we did 
we did that, we gave meds, we just did everything there was that needed, that needed doing. And, we, and you didn't ask for a doctor's order, you didn't have to record, I mean you did try to record what you'd done, but um, it was a, it's quite different from nursing today. Occasionally we would get patients from underground hospitals. The VC had a whole series of tunnels, I mean 270 kilometers in down in Kuchi alone. Uh, and anybody who goes back to Vietnam ought to visit those to really just get a full grasp of what was going on. But occasionally tunnel rats would go in and they'd flush out one of these tunnels in the area where we were and we'd get patients in. Unbelievable. I mean, limbs, broken limbs in, in these see-through casts, maggots running up and down the legs and covered with dirt, just filthy, filthy, filthy. Um, I think all of us had some sort of spirit, spiritual background or spirituality, whether it was, you know, whether it was organized religion or you just, I th what do they say, you find religion when you need it or something like that. Um, no atheists in the foxhole? That's, that's, that's the expression. Um, but I don't know what was going through my mind, to be honest with you. Sometimes it was just a blur and it was the physical sense of holding a hand and yet we were maybe even at the same time communicating with something else that was going on, and, you know, asking questions or answering. It's, it just depended on the situation. If we only had one or two casualties, then it was probably a more interactive sort of thing. Otherwise, it was more a, I am here, but there's all this hubbub going on and, you know, you're dealing with a lot of different things at one time. Vietnam was not a war where the enemy had a really different face from everybody else. Um, when you saw a Vietnamese person, you weren't quite sure whether they were friend or enemy, which created lots of issues for the guys out in the field. And, um, it, you know, sometimes you could get a feel for the fact that the, you thought, well, maybe the enemy looks different, but they really didn't. I mean, the, the, a big issue was not just incoming mortar rounds, but uh, snipers that would snip wires and crawl in and just mingle with the rest of the, you know, of the South Vietnamese friendlies. So that was, <clears throat> that was, I think, a big issue in Vietnam is that there were too many people looking alike. That's, I guess that sounds strange, but it's really true. And it's similar to uh, what we hear now with um, uh, suicide bombers and things, strapping things onto children. Um, there were you, women, children, who fought for the other side for the cause. And so you did not know whether that child you were looking at was friendly or not. And there were also, quote, front lines in the other wars. There were no front lines in, in Vietnam. I mean, we would take mortar attacks. Uh, they, the North Vietnamese seemed to celebrate the seasons and the holidays by, by uh, bombing us. So we would get incoming rockets like on the vernal equinox and the autumnal equinox and that sort of thing. And, and Tet, the Tet Offensive, of course, was around the New Year's time period. But uh, they really, that was just that was just something, there were no front lines. It wasn't like, okay, you're there and I'm here and I'm gonna shoot you because you're in front of me. It was all around. It was all around, so there was no way to know. Well, I think when I arrived, I, I think I had the Florence Nightingale syndrome, which was I was gonna save the world and I was gonna save lives and I was doing wonderful, wonderful work, which I did. I mean, I, I think every day we saved lives. There's an old joke in nursing school, we'd go off to, you know, the hospital to save lives and we never really saved lives, but we truly were saving lives every day. I would like to think that we would learn from our past. I'm not sure right now we have learned from our past, but I would like to think that the more we talk about what war really is, it's not Rambo and it's not the movies you see, it's reality. Um, and I think the more we can speak to that, the better we can educate young, young minds.
Good day. My name is Larry Capetto, and I'm the producer of the award-winning public television documentary series, Lest They Be Forgotten, which many of you have been watching on my YouTube channel, Voices of History. Currently, there are 12 films in the series spanning over 80 years of history. For the past 15 years, I've been documenting and recording stories from American and Canadian war veterans, assembling one of the largest oral histories ever recorded of Americans at war. My newest project, Women in War, features stories from many of the women I have interviewed over the years. A lot of these women served during World War II, but are now gone. It is my responsibility to help tell their stories, for future generations and for history's sake, so that we will never forget the sacrifices women have made in service to their country. I need your help. For the first time, I'm offering you an opportunity to invest in this project and partner with me. In exchange, I will bestow upon you the title of associate producer and give you a credit in the film and on the DVD cover. You will take pride and ownership in this project and afford me the opportunity to produce the 13th film in the series. My hope is to hear from some of you today. Please feel free to contact me. All the information is on the screen and in the video description below. On behalf of all the veterans I've interviewed over the years for this historic project, thank you for your help and support.